very quickly introduce uh, the three uh, facilitators for each panel, and then we'll move on to the first panel. So the facilitator of the first panel is also the um, co-editor uh, of the collection, uh, and that is uh, uh, Rama Dieng. So Rama um, is a, a Sengalese scholar activist and a mom. She is a lecturer at the Center for African Studies at the University of Edinburgh, uh, which is the main sponsor of this event. Her research focuses on African feminisms, feminist political economy, agrarian studies and gender and development in Africa. She holds a PhD and an MSc in international development from SOAS, University of London, and a master in international cooperation from Sciences Po in Bordeaux. She is an introvert, she says, uh, loves, I think it must be extrovert. She loves gathering people around to discuss, share ideas or food. And when she is not hiding to read a book or just enjoy the silence. The second, the facilitator of the uh, second uh, uh, conversation is Lynn Osman, Osum. Uh, Lynn is um, a senior research fellow at Makera Institute of Social Research, where she teaches politics and political economy. She is the author most recently of Gender, Ethnicity and Violence in Kenya's Transitions to Democracy, States of Violence, and co-editor of the forthcoming volume, Labour Questions in the Global South. She serves on several boards, including the International Association for Feminist Economics and the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa. And she organizes on several fronts with feminist and agrarian uh, movements. Our third facilitator for conversation three um, is Usman Diop. Usman has worked for the British Council for over six years uh, and then has worked for the Houses of Parliament and a variety of projects. He met his partner in Senegal, which he left in 2008 to join her in London. He's passionate about politics and, homes, and holds an MRes in public policy and management from Birkbeck University. He enjoys football, photography and fixing things. And more than anything, he loves good discussions about the state of the world over some good food. He has just re relocated back to Senegal with his family. Okay, so without uh, any further ado, uh, I'd like us to, uh, to move across to the first conversation, uh, which is facilitated by Rama. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you so, so much, Fiona, for this uh, introduction. I am really, really excited, thrilled to be there in this conversation um, for this book launch. As uh, Fiona has mentioned, it is a labor of love. 30 parents came together to share about their personal experiences of trying to reconcile their feminist principles with their uh, uh, parenting um, experience. So today, uh, what we would like to start with is the first panel, which is about feminist uh, mothering journeys. First of all, I would like to introduce our speakers. We have a very diverse and exciting uh, lineup. The first speaker is um, Gertrude Torviquet, who just completed a PhD in development studies at the University of Ghana. And she is also working with Feminist Africa right now. She is a program officer of Feminist Africa. Our second speaker is um, Cheryl Hendricks, Professor Cheryl Hendricks, who is a professor of politics and who works on gender, peace and security at the university, uh, who is now currently the executive director of the Africa Institute of South Africa. And uh, we are very thrilled that Cheryl is here. Her daughter, uh, Malaika Ayo, will also join us in the third panel. Then we have Catherine Touré, who worked on, uh, at Africa Online and who is now with the Africa uh, Office of the International Development Research Center in Kenya. She is uh, one of the editors of Langa, which publishes 40 books a year on Africa and the greater uh, Kansas City Black History Study Group. Then we have Astrid As, who found it difficult to really categorize herself. And she's half Ugandan, half Austrian. She loves football. And today she will share with us about the immense privilege she has had 
to be a mama to the most amazing baby girl. Finally, we have Eli Wright, who will uh, tell us about her experience of being a young uh, feminist born in Ecuador by, and uh, raised by a widowed uh, mother. She's currently at the University of uh, Sussex um, doing a master's on gender violence and conflict. And Eli has several years of experience working in NGOs and in the public sector. She's also a fierce feminist. So if you would allow me to please welcome our five guests whose bio you can find on the chat right now, on the chat box. So I think what is exciting here is we have the opportunity, rather than me being there talking about the book or Andrea who sends her apologies, her apologies for not being able to join us, we have the opportunity to hear uh, from the very authors of the, con of the contributions what their experiences of feminist mothering had been. So we start with Eli, who's, who wrote the chapter, why I decided not to uh, parent and why I will not regret it. Her name is Ellie, not Eli, sorry, Elizabeth Ventimilla. So Ellie, can you please tell us about your choice not to parent, which is also based on your feminist principles and how or what has changed since you wrote that chapter. Thank you so yeah. much. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Rama, and thank you everyone who's, who's here uh, joining us. Um, yes, so as you mentioned, my, my chapter is called Why I Have Decided Not to Parent and Why I Won't Regret It, which shows a little bit what it is about. Uh, and first, I would like to say that I think that deciding not to have children is definitely a privilege. I think that most women and people around the world don't have access to choice and, and, and the, the possibility of controlling their, their reproductive health. So I would like to just start saying that, which I also mentioned in the chapter, it's, it's definitely a privilege. Um, and my chapter is in a way a list of some of the reasons why I have decided not to have children. Um, but also uh, the chapter, like each of these reasons comes with some sort of story or experience uh, connected to each reason. Um, and some of it has to do with some of my fears that I have. Um, and as you said, I, and I, as I mentioned in my bio, I was raised by a widowed mother. So I, I, I fear a lot of, you know, kind of negative or, or dangerous things that could happen. Um, I also fear the, the level of responsibility. Um, and yes, just, just many, many reasons that you, you people can read in the, in the chapter. But I, I finished the chapter saying that, you know, I, I don't want to and, that, and that's already a valid reason, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I would also like to share a little bit about people's responses to, to, to this decision. Uh, in my experience, um, people, I, I, I guess it's not, we don't normalize the decision to not have children, right? The normal decision is to, to become parents. Um, and so people react in a way, you know, telling me that I'm too young to decide this or that I'm definitely going to regret it. Um, family, friends, even doctors have told me, you know, uh, you're, you're going to regret it and you're, and you're too young to, to know this. Um, so, yes, and um, I think that writing my, my chapter was very cathartic um, because I've made, the de I made this decision many years ago. But when I wrote the chapter, I was able to sort of pour everything out and, 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 and describe all my reasons. Um, and it kind of reinforced my decision, right? I mean, I've, I've, most of these years, I've been very, very um, uh, kind of sure about my, uh, about my decision. But writing the chapter definitely helped me to put it all together and to put it in writing. It was, it was, it was very cathartic. That's why I, I very, I, I'm, I'm so grateful for, for the opportunity to participate and to join and to be part of this book that, you know, is about feminist parenting and, and, and mine is a bit um, from a feminist perspective, of course, but it's, it's a kind of a different perspective. Um, and I, I guess not much has changed since I wrote the chapter <laughs> in the sense that I, that I, I still, um, I'm, I'm still uh, very, uh, like I said, sure about, about my decision. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been, I guess, uh, two years since we started, two or three years since we started working on this. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I also, um, like I said, my chapter has a feminist perspective. And um, I would just like to finish by saying that I, I'm definitely aware that 
you know, becoming a, a, a parent is also a feminist choice, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I definitely recognize all the, the labor and, uh, and, and all the work that, that comes with, with parenting. I, I witnessed my, my mother raise four teenagers by herself since, since we lost my, my father, right? So I, I, I definitely admire and, and love so many mothers and parents in my life. But um, I also think that deciding not to take that path is is also a feminist decision. It's it's all about, uh, I guess, choice and and freedom. So yeah, I think that's all. I, yeah. Thank you so much, Eli. Eli, and in your chapter, you're sharing something really powerful. You are quoting Mexican feminist Karina Vergara Sanchez, uh, who was saying that it is capitalism and actually not motherhood, that steals the life and happiness of mothers because of unrealistic standards of productivity and success. So I think all this has uh, informed also your choice not to become a parent. And now I would like to invite Astrid As in the conversation because I think your chapter very much speaks to hers because her uh, journey to mothering was a con conscious uh, decision to create her own happily ever after, as she says it. So Astrid, can you please tell us about your journey to mothering? Uh, what are the type of uh, reactions that you have had, the unsolicited advice that you have had? And um, how did you finally manage to craft your own uh, definition or standards of feminist mothering? Thank you, Astrid. Thanks, Rama. Thanks both for inviting me to talk here, but more importantly, to be able to write the chapter. Like with uh, Ellie, I found it incredibly cathartic to be able to, to process a lot. So I appreciate the, the, the writing process. Um, but I think the best way to start is just to say I was conditioned by Disney and by every chick flick that is out there. As in, I was expecting my Prince Charming to be coming riding on a white horse at sunset, scoop me up. Uh, then we would get married and buy a house and have a dog and, and, and two kids, maybe three. And that was what I thought my life was going to be. And that was what I was working towards. So, you know, I was at university. I finished university. I started working. I thought, okay, well, great. Like, let me work a couple of years and then it will happen. And it never happened. Um, I am 34 now. I have been in a handful of very, very short relationships. And this really bothered me. Mm -hmm. And because it wasn't what I had expected and it wasn't what I thought the plan for the world for women like me should be. Mm -hmm. And you go out and you ask people what's wrong and they're like, oh, well, you're too strong and you're too independent and, and men are scared of you. So I was like, okay, well, then I really got to change myself. The problem is I couldn't change myself because that's who I am. And instead what happened is that I became depressed, um, you know, legitimately clinical depression. But that was my turning point because it's when I sought help and it's when I sought to unpack what is it that's actually making me? What is it about this story not coming true and this not being my happily ever after that's really bothering me? Mm -hmm. When I started to unpack that, I realized it's because I had always associated that I needed to be married before I had kids. And I really wanted children. I've always really wanted children. I was always that girl who had to take her, not only her doll, but her doll's stroller and her doll's changing bag everywhere with me. Like I was really, really wanting to have children. And so then I took a step back and I thought, well, that shouldn't be the thing that's inhibited by my story. I should still be able to have a kid. And in fact, um, I'd always wanted to adopt as well. And so then I decided, um, so I'm from Uganda. I'm currently sitting in Uganda. I'm actually, in fact, currently sitting by the source of the Nile. Uh, decided to, to come for the weekend. Um, and, and so interestingly, uh, Uganda is extremely progressive in the way it sees adoption because it does allow for single parent adoption, both single mothers and single fathers. And that's not the case in most countries. My other country, Austria, you actually have to be married, I think, for five years before you're even considered um, for, for adoption. So I thought, great, well, you know, Time, time to turn, turn my, my plan around, put my dreams into action. And, and that's what I decided to do. And I was 30 when I made the decision and I announced it and I thought everyone was gonna be really happy for me because uh, you know, most, a lot of my friends already had one child, some even two, some even more children. And everyone's like, have you really thought about it? And this reaction really took me aback because I thought, wait, I'm telling you I'm having a kid. Uh, you know, I assumed if I told you I was pregnant, it would be congratulations as opposed to, have you really thought about it? And it went even deeper than that. Um, 
it went, you know, people from, and I, and I talk about this in the chapter about some of the reactions that I got, but I think the two that really stand out was the ones who then told me, well, then you're never going to get married. Which, which, which man is ever going to accept the fact that you decided to go out and adopt by yourself? Now you're sort of putting the nail in the coffin. This is definitely never going to happen to you. And a lot of people, people who I was also really close to, you know, giving me this unsolicited advice. And then I think here in Uganda, the other part is, is that having children is really a sign of worth for the woman. And someone came up to me and said to me, well, now you're just advertising that you're not able to produce. And I was like, uh, well, A, I don't even know that. And B, that's none of your business to talk about my uterus. And, 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 and so a lot of these, you know, I had prepared myself for a lot embarking on the adoption journey. I knew it wasn't going to be easy. What I hadn't really prepared myself for, and which was, I was taken a little bit aback was, was the amount of unsolicited advice. So it seems like we live in a world where women are still expected to have children, sort of to, to Eli's comment. And at the same time, we're also expected to have children in a certain way as determined by society. Um, however, I think a mark of how far I'd come was a, that I was able to ignore this. Even this whole, you are never gonna get married. I was like, that's fine. You know, if that's, if that's what it is, that's fine. I'm putting this aside, I'm gonna go on my journey. And the journey took a long time. Um, it took, um, uh, from start to finish, well, start until I finally had the court papers for my, my, my daughter. It took three and a half years. But it was by far the best decision I have ever made, and I, I am very sure I will ever make in my life. And I think, um, I think it was difficult, but it was important for me to go through all the previous steps to be able to come to the point where I was able to make the, the decision at the time I made it and to give me the strength to go through the process. When I wrote the chapter, my daughter was one, she'd only been home for one month. Um, so I was on maternity leave. She was a great sleeper, which also gave me the time to write the chapter. And now obviously she's a, she's a very lively toddler. It's two years from now. And I think, you know, the things that changed with her coming into my life is one, I wasn't scared to cut people out of my life. If they didn't accept my journey, if they didn't accept who I was, if they didn't accept me as a mother, that's it, fine, you know, great, that's, you know, we don't need to be. However, at the same time, um, when she came into my life, everyone's like, she's so clearly your daughter. And there was far less, you know, controversy about it as opposed to when it was a theoretical decision. Secondly, I think um, the adoption journey itself, which is not written about in the book because I was right at the beginning of a lot of the, the, the parts that were to come, was the toughest thing I've ever done. So I think the, the part about being a single parent adopting, the part I think I underestimated is having another adult in the journey who's as invested in the process as you are. Because it's not about just celebrating the highs and crying about the lows, it's about making all the decisions and not really knowing. I mean, as a parent, generally you kind of are going into the dark the first time you do it. As you know, in an adoption journey, it's sort of all very elevated. I think, um, you know, I speak in the book about how I really wanted to bring up my daughter very much as a feminist. I didn't start this journey as a feminist. I definitely come out saying I'm a very proud feminist. It's more difficult than I thought because actually the world I feel since I've become a mother to a girl has moved backwards. I mean, some of the things that are happening these days, you can't believe that you're in 2020. So it's not even that you're fighting against normal societal forces. Society itself seems to be moving back. Um, the thing that hasn't changed is that I'm single. Uh, and I remain single all this time. And, you know, sometimes I question myself, am I still waiting for Prince Charming to come riding through the sunset? And yeah, you know, it would be nice to have a second pair of hands at home and a second parent. Unlike some though, I don't know how it is to have two parents at home. I've only ever been a single parent and I've been a single parent for choice. But I think for me, the thing that has changed is if the bar was high before about someone coming into our life, the bar is even higher now. Because quite frankly, like, I couldn't find right now one thing that I would want to change about our personal life. I think it was really being, you know, I, I titled the, 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 the chapter, putting my dreams into action. And really it is sort of my own happily ever after, even though obviously we still have a long, long, long life ahead of us, but really that was what it is. And so what I want to pass on to my daughter and I'll just end on this is the ability to have choices, to make the choices that she wants and to pursue her dreams. Thank you so, so much, Astrid, for this, uh, for this really powerful testimony. And I, th I think it still takes a lot of uh, courage and people don't realize 
to make such a choice uh, as a young woman, it is not expected. But well, feminists, I guess, are not doing what is expected of them. Thank you so much. And I think you also said something that is striking to me when you were talking about single parenting, being a single parent. To me, there is no such thing as being a single parent because doing parenting is a full-time job. It is a full-time work. So thank you so much for this testimony. Now I would like to uh, uh, pass the floor to Cheryl Hendricks. Uh, who shared this very powerful definition of feminist mothering that I will share with you. Feminist mothering is about resisting patriarchal norms of motherhood, transforming gendered power relations, and providing those whom we mother with sufficient exposure to and understanding of difference and equality so that they can construct their own ways of being in the world. Feminist mothering liberates both mother and child. It, situated them, it situates them as actors of social change. So on this very powerful definition, Cheryl, I would like to in, uh, invite you. You wrote your chapter with your daughter Malaika, who will be talking in the last panel. Can you please tell us what your uh, experience of feminist parenting as a pan-Africanist, you insisted on this word, as a pan-Africanist, what does it look like at home? Uh, thank you, Rama. Um... I must start off by saying that when Rama first invited me uh, to contribute to this book, I think we were sitting somewhere in Rwanda, uh, I didn't hesitate to say yes, but when it came to the actual time of writing, I realized that we as academics don't often reflect uh, on our personal journeys, and we certainly don't write about them very often. So I found it a bit challenging to do so, but I do want to thank you and Andrea as your co-editor for providing that space to us to, to be able to reflect on our, our journeys and to weave our personal stories together so, so beautifully um, and have us define for ourselves what feminist, feminist parent, parenting is. So, I was a parent and still am a parent, uh, although Malaika is now in Toronto, but first in Toronto and then in South Africa. And I think you first asked me to, to speak about parenting in South Africa and then what a Pan-African uh, parent uh, means to me um, and how I think I um, translated that into the home. So South Africa, as you all know, a uh, very racialized space, very patriarchal space was that and continues to be that. But that many of us um, have worked and continue to work to be able to transform our societies. So it obviously impacts the way in which we see ourselves and what we want to do uh, in, our in our societies. And so I think that my feminist journey, my intellectual journey, my journey on Pan-Africanism and my mothering journey have all intersected here um, and, and certainly defined by my experiences of growing up in South Africa as well. So let me situate everybody, I think, in the 1980s firstly. So we're talking late 1980s, early 1990s, where I would have had my master's degree there were a few of us, not very many African women wanting to be academics in South Africa because that was a relatively close space. And we were supporting each other, but we were also trying to, to change the end. So those academic institutions uh, were racialized. Uh, they were patriarchal spaces, certainly not ready for, for black bodies and for black intellectual thought. And, and we needed to transform that, but we also needed to look after and support ourselves. Um, we often had discussions about motherhood. And I, I recall that some indicated very, very upfront, I'm not going to be a mother. I, I, I don't want to have children and for varied reasons, whether it was uh, sexual identity, whether they saw that as career limiting, or whether they simply could not see themselves in the role of being a mother. Others, like myself, definitely chose to be a mother. 
named our child, I named my child long before uh, I actually had it. So it was a very conscious choice, I think, to be a mother. And I think that is where I want to uh, put my first full stop, I guess, uh, that feminist mothering, feminist parenting is about exercising choice. It is about choosing to be a mother, choosing not to be a mother, or choosing uh, first to be a mother and then not again to be a mother, not having any more children. There are a number of choices involved. And, and I think, as you mentioned in the book, uh, we have to define it as a political act, that that notion of uh, choosing to be a mother or not to be a mother. It's about debunk debunking those myths about women and their role in society, about taking control over your reproductive health, about disrupting gender relations here. Um, my, my second full stop moment then and related to my pan-Africanism is that motherhood is not our only identity and that it is about being a mother, that role, it's about the child and the child's development, it's about society and for me about the continent at large, or who we are choosing to bring into this world, how we're we shaping them so that they can contribute to a larger society. So I am a mother. I am somebody's daughter. I am a pan-Africanist. I'm an educator. I'm a, a social activist. I'm many things. And all of those identities also have to be recognized. And so for me, pan-Africanism, because you asked me specifically about that, is about... Uh, dignity, it's about solidarity, it's about unity, it's about um, creating those transnational linkages um, uh, and being in a struggle that unites us all to create uh, a peaceful, prosperous continent here. The, the motherhood section of that is also, I think, for me, one about taking care of ourselves, because this I tend to stress a lot that uh, feminist parenting, pan-Africanist feminist parenting is also about taking care of yourself, not just about everybody. Self-nurturing is important because you cannot produce the kind of child uh, that you want to have in a society, you will be able to go out there and change society if you are not yourself um, emotionally well looked after, physically well looked after. So that becomes important. Um, so the choices that I made, my career choices, my personal choices, were all informed by that. So I write in the piece about my, my being in Toronto, but also my leaving Toronto. Um, and for me, that was about my own emotional well-being. It was about uh, my, my sense of security, because I felt that I was becoming too dependent um, in, in, real, in Toronto, losing myself in that particular space. And because I wanted to be on the continent and I wanted to make change here, I rem remember having a job offer for Saskatchewan University and thinking to myself, why would I want to go to Saskatchewan University? It's a choice that I have not regretted coming back to South Africa, but it meant leaving my daughter in Toronto and her not being with me. Um, so, so those are the kinds of choices we make. And the, the second question you had posed was around parenting from a distance. So one parented as a distance, at a distance when I was in Toronto and uh, having a postdoc at the University of Rochester, so she wouldn't be with me during the week. Uh, parenting from a distance when I was in South Africa and she was in Toronto and now again parenting at a distance because she's back in Toronto and that role as a parent changes but it does not end okay and and I think that we, we can do that so we can have the career we can be the parent we can parent at a distance uh, because it's about shaping values Laying, laying that foundation, values, ethics, principles uh, in our children. And, and that's what we, um, we take forward, I think. Assisting them to move and think beyond the narrow confines and constructions of, of gender, of race, and of nationalism, and, and going out there 
to, to change society, I think. Um, and if I, I hope either that I've given her, she can speak for herself, she's here. I hope that I have in, instilled that. And I think that Malaika has been very fortunate in that um, she's not only had my form of parenting, but she's also had her father's form of parenting. And, and that has developed as, uh, an independent, uh, strong world, critically minded person that I think has the kind of ethics that we want from any Pan-Africanist. Because part of our feminist mothering must also be about um, the kinds of children um, and the values that they have uh, in, in society. So what, it, what has changed, and yes, I say it's liberating. It's liberating for me, it's liberating for her, and hopefully liberating for society as we become agents of social change. Uh, in the two or three years since then, I would say what has changed is Malaika, um, now lives with her father in Toronto, so she is on another uh, feminist parenting path, experiencing that as well. She has become a, a feminist in her own right. She's grown up right. Um, and I, I think uh, become all that I would have expected it to become and that that critical mind, I think I need to say that, that critical mind and gaze uh, that we instill has also been turned on me, right? So <laughs> the, the, the child then also reflects uh, your parenting and challenges you. But I smile because that is the kind of child, um, now an adult, that I, I would want to see in the world. Um, for me, now that she's gone, I have the space to do all the things that I love to do. So I love to travel. I traveled extensively then. I travel even more now, except for lockdown. I pamper myself even more. Um, I engage in um, my activism um, across the continent and in my intellectualism across the continent. Yeah. Thank you so, so much, Cheryl, for this uh, really powerful account. Uh, I think I really learned a lot from your chapter, more specifically as, a, as, a, as an early career researcher. It was really informative and enriching and uh, empowering to read uh, what the journey had been like for you. And really looking forward to hearing from Malaika later. So now I would like to uh, uh, talk to Jifa Tovike. Is Jifa here? Because I couldn't see her. Yes. No. Welcome, Jifa. So I really enjoyed reading your chapter. You were sharing about us. Uh, you were sharing about your triangular experience in Ghana, how your feminist mothering practice had been informed by uh, evolving in your uh, grandmother's matriarchal house, then moving to your uh, father's or stepmother's polygynous uh, household, and then having your own monogamous uh, conjugal context. So how has this triangular experience informed your practice? And what can you tell us about how you negotiate power with the other significant others, whether it is the school, whether it is uh, the church, or other social institutions, as a teacher yourself. Thank you, Rama. Um, and for uh, the opportunity to share uh, our stories. Uh, my chapter is um, about my, it's a memoir in, in, in motion, as I name it, and I name it not knowing that at the time I read the chapter, I'll, I'll have another child. So a child came after the chapter. So it's really a journey and it's in motion. Um, the chapter is an accumulation of reactions and um, experiences of living in different types of households. So I grew up in the Volta region and lived with my grandmother. And my, my father lived in another house. And then my father's wife lived in another house. Um, but then we have to interact in that triangular setting. The house is not too far away from uh, one another. So um, 
it's so you have different kinds of experience maybe with my my grandmother who at the time was a, a widow and so she so she was the the main person in the house but from time to time my father came in and i saw how she was able to hold the house together and as a child we 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 did many things together i i, I was one of the last to live with her before she died and and so i was attached to my grandmother in a, a, a particular way my grandmother practiced the african traditional religion i followed her to the shrine most often and i could see the blending that with my presbyterian upbringing my father in the other house the presbyterian and my grandmother in where i live um, traditional African religion and blending all that gave me a certain sense of diversity and how to negotiate different, um, then I have to move to my stepmother's house at a point and that is also another experience over there you you, you knew that that's not your mother and then you are told that that's not your mother that society tells you that's not your mother so you have to be careful and then at the same time you have to know that she's your mother so you are negotiating all that as a child growing up nobody comes to tell you uh, it's not deliberate that somebody tells you how to behave when, when you are in your father's house and you're in your mother's house or your grandmother's house okay so moving from there um because of migration i became the household head at a point in accra when we live with 11 siblings who all migrate to Accra. And then I started uh, using some of these accumulated experiences to guide my siblings. And many girls, many of them girls, so it's, it's more challenging for you to make them understand how you have to um, construct your life in a way that uh, you do not fall back into what the traps that society uh, gives you. And you could see that many of them were struggling to to get what I was trying to say. Um, then from there, I got married. And that's where most of the stories in the, the work also centered on my own children and how in the household, that household is look monogamous, uh, married to one man, but then in the house, there are many, many, many people just looking like my grandmother's house where we live with many people. I had a domestic worker who, who is so influential in the house. She's elderly, she's older than me, and lived with the children more than myself because I had to travel. So she has a lot of influence. And also, she is uh, very experienced. She had, she, she's a feminist in her own way. She, 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 she lost children. She, lost, she, she divorced. And so in everything, she, I was also learning from her. Although she worked for me, I learned a lot from her. I think I learned more from her than I, she did from me, actually. And, and so from there, I realized that sometimes our ideas clashed. For instance, if my boy should to do some housework, she would say no. But then I have to persuade her. Uh, she's my worker, you have to pamper her in the way, but you have to also make her understand that uh, it's important that uh, some of the things we are saying are, are together. So for instance, when I am out of the town, I come by and the boy will complain that she said I shouldn't do anything. Then I ask why? I said, but she sh he shouldn't be doing this. So in, way, in some ways, she herself is a feminist practicing it, but in other ways, she also goes back to the traditional crafting of what um, children should do, boys, boys should do, and girls should do. But in all that, I realized that I'm not uh, only, it's only the household that also shapes parenting, the school as well. I love to go to PTA meetings and I love to go to my children's school a lot because a lot of the things, they, they, they come home with a lot of these trappings of society 
what boys should do, what girls should do. And some of them are also historical, uh, the artifacts that they see in schools, like in the, our national anthem, in our pledge, you see the, uh, the, 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 the whoever wrote them, as though males over women, like, so you have to explain to them, I'm a trained teacher, so I, I'm able to identify some of these things. The assignments, I look at the assignments so critically, I, I discuss with them, so I have to call the teacher to say, why did you write this sentence? For, for, for the child. Why, why should we say that my father pays my school fees? Why is that you, you, you don't allow students to create their own stories, but you are telling them what might not be the truth? It is, so, so at the PTA meetings, I have to bring parents to understand that some of these things are no longer just passing comments. They are, they are very political and they are shaping the way children uh, uh, react or how they assimilate what society is telling them, and then they have to change. I think at the point the school said they were inviting me to give a, a small talk on, uh, on gender issues, and I think that's a plus, that from the home, I'm able to send the same message to the school, which is more difficult. It, it's difficult for the school to change its ways, that, because they are following a syllabus, a curriculum that the, the, the state itself has engineered and it's engineered within a patriarchal thinking. So we need um, more of these uh, reactions from parents. So my stories are uh, scattered because of my multiple selves. I have multiple selves in me. So I wrote about the, the household, the, my past experience in the school, and also the neighbors, and also to, to for us to reflect on the fact that the significant others, uh, like domestic workers, also shape the way our children uh, would turn out. And so the message of feminist parenting should get to them to, we should make conscious efforts to see. They have agency, but then uh, for us to, to, to discuss some of these things at home so that um, we can, uh, our thinking can cohere in a way. Otherwise, you have children that are going far away. Uh, I think briefly that's what I, I wrote about. Thank you, Grandma. Thank you so, so much, Jifa, for sharing your experience. I think it is really an embodiment of what an intersectional and uh, decolonial approach to feminist parenting is. I think rather than uh, theorizing it uh, um, and having a one-size-fits-all approach, we need to take into account consideration the specific setting in which parenting takes place. It's not something that we do alone. As the code says, it's, uh, you know, we need to bring the village back in the feminist parenting practice. So thank you so much for this powerful account. I think it's something that will uh, speak to uh, Catherine Touré's experience. Catherine was sharing how in uh, Côte d'Ivoire as well, she was uh, uh, parenting kids that were not her own, her birth uh, kids, like, um, uh, like you just mentioned, Jifa. So today, let me ask uh, Catherine Touré, who has written this very powerful chapter about parenting across countries, cultures, and generation, what she has learned from her grandmother, from her mother, and what she has passed on to her children, and how she has also learned from her own children. Please. Catherine, you have the floor. Grand merci, uh, Rama. Contente uh, d'être ici. Uh, Jifa, Ellie, Astrid, Cheryl, Fiona, Lynn, Usman, my adult son who woke up early to join this, and to everybody else in this long list of 70 participants. Uh, very great to be here. Very inspiring conversations. Um, like Rama said, we don't do parenting alone, and I wrote on parenting across cultures, continents, and generations. So I want to focus on that third part about generations. But briefly, parenting across cultures is so rich, not just for ourselves, for the children that we're raising, but for our extended families because of the diversity that we bring into the extended families. And parenting across continents is also amazing because the young people that we're parenting from day one, they have been negotiating across language and cultures and ways of thinking and knowing and doing. So I would say that they understand 
life and culture and history in more nuanced ways, uh, intuitively, things that like my husband and I could only pick up after decades. But parenting across generations, I found in writing this chapter how powerful that has been for me because it allowed to me to think about my mother, to think about my grandmother, to think about my great great grandmother who delivered my grandmother in an upstairs bedroom while the doctor was waiting downstairs with his satchel just in case he was needed. And then once he saw that the baby had been delivered and was healthy, he got into his horse and buggy and he went his way. So I realized that we, you know, how we draw on the traditions uh, within our families in crafting how we parent going forward. And then it was only after I married my husband and after we had started parenting that I learned that my husband's grandmother was in Kachala in Cote d'Ivoire catching babies and that she was the person in the community that was consulted if you had an ailment um, people would come and she would prescribe what uh, plant might be good for them in that uh, situation. So even though we don't know Grandma Aya, we can still go to Kachala, we can still talk to people who know her, and we can uncover that story that actually gets buried because people will say, you know, if you ask about her, they might say, oh yeah, yeah, she, she had her field and she raised her children. But then when you go further, well, did she catch babies? Oh yeah, she did that too. Well, did people come for her to get you know, advice from her? Oh yes. So this, this need to unearth history so that we can connect with traditions that are important for us. And Rama and others have mentioned something that has changed. Like what's not changed, I think, in parenting, it's like just putting that love in our heart. Mom always said, make sure the kids know they're loved. What has changed is that we're currently in this double pandemic <laughs> of COVID and the exposure worldwide of, of, of racism. So at this time, you know, I see us talking from a distance uh, with the family about what's going on and what we can do. So I'm proud that my niece in, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire is working with her um, little sister and her cousin to help them with their studies since they're out of school that my daughter is wanting to sign up for diversity and inclusion assignments at work and become a poll worker in the uh, elections in the United States in November, and that my son joined a social justice discussion in Black employee groups at his first job after completing his studies and wants to put some money into a Black-owned bank. So I think being a feminist parent always and these days is also being an anti-racist um, parent and that these issues need to be discussed in the family. And to wrap up, I would just like to say that for me, there's no perfection in being a feminist parent. Obviously, we weren't born parents. We are all learning as we are uh, going. We are persevering. And thank goodness our children, I believe, help us. At least I found that. If you get off course, they say, you know, uh, they explain things to you and they give you cues to help you along the way. So thanks very much, Rama, and back over to you. Thanks so, so much for sharing your experience, Catherine, of what, had, what it had been for you to parent. Uh, also from a distance right now with the pandemic. So um, I think what I learned from, from this uh, panel and what I have learned from all the contributors actually is that we need also to uh, repoliticize parenting, that it's not something uh, that we do, uh, you know, uh, that we can divorce from our acts of every day. And I will add that it's not only being an anti-racist uh, parent, it is also being an anti-homophobic, an anti-transphobia, uh, an anti, you know, uh, being really inclusive and accepting difference. And because that's what makes us richer. I also take from this panel that uh, all of us are learning and there is room for improvement and there is room for learning from our children and from others in community. It's not something that we do alone. And really thank you so much for sharing these experiences. I think it is really great to see that uh, um, 
parenting does not only is not only happening through giving birth it also happens through fostering through other mothering through really uh, with significant others it's not something that one does alone so thank you so much for sharing these really really powerful uh, experiences i will now pass on to to lynn awesome who lynn Osome, who is the one uh, facilitating the panel the second panel thank you so much Okay. Um, thank you, Rama. Thank you for this invitation to uh, participate in this discussion. I, I, I read the book and I found it very empowering. Um, you know, it's a, it's a book that I found relatable to even uh, people, uh, especially those who identify as feminist, who had children or didn't have children. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to chair this uh, session on, um, on struggles and resistance. Um, there are five uh, uh, contributors on this panel. I won't, I won't introduce them. I think the, the bias are in the, in the chat box, I believe. Um, I'll go straight into just um, uh, prompting some kind of discussion for each of them. I found, you know, there were common themes in your experiences with, with, with parenting. Um, I particularly, uh, you know, was struck by, you know, your individual co and collective stories, um, you know, showed the ways in which uh, you are confronting you know, emotions uh, that were around guilt, around grief, around anger, around resentment, loneliness, shame. Uh, and, and in a dialectical way, you seem to be describing how these experiences uh, then, uh, you know, the di dialectical relationship between these emotions and experiences and feminist uh, parenting, almost as a thing of necessity that feminism had to kind of kick in. But I want to start with um, the first uh, contributor, uh, Masana Dinga Kanga. Uh, Masana, I can't see you. Hi, good to Hi. see you. <laughs> So, you know, I was really struck with your, with your, in your chapter, uh, you, you, you speak of struggles to hold the space of legitimate anger. And you speak of this as, uh, you know, as feminist. Right? And as, you know, so you think of yourself as a political being and as a parent. And through this is, you know, the, the constant tension in your chapter is this, uh, this re relationship with anger and you trying to think, okay, this is a legitimate expression of how I'm living this journey. And, and you spoke about how contempt and rage, uh, which are healthy human responses, black women, um, no, but, but you know, then you're thinking of them as very necessary in mobilizing and moving our bodies as black women to places of nurturing and uh, places of health. So in, in this sense, could you then just reflect on, on your chapter and especially on these issues, which I think were just really striking in your contribution. Uh, thanks so much, Lynn, and thanks to everyone who's made the time on a Saturday to be here um, to join this, I think, very intimate but uh, critical conversation at this time, particularly with the pandemic when we're seeing across the world that not only are spaces closing, 
but the ways in which power is intersecting in the personal space becomes critical then for, again, this uh, re-emphasis on sort of these cisgender heteronormative ideas of parenting and showing up not just in the world of work, but also in the personal space. Um, in my chapter, you know, which I wrote when my daughter Elikia uh, was two years old, she's now five, I can't believe it. Um, I reflect really on what the practice of feminism means, particularly in a country like South Africa. I'm South African, I'm queer, I'm a woman, um, an able-bodied woman living in the middle class. Uh, in a society that is fundamentally misogynistic, a society that is uh, deeply prejudiced against not just the acts of being, but the ways in which those acts of being are legitimized, more broadly speaking. Um, and one of the critical reflections on this was this conception in a very Christian society of the father, the father is the embodiment of ultimate love. The, the Christian God is the ultimate expression of love. And almost the lack of questioning of his insatiable thirst for blood and sacrifice, right? And how this intersects so deeply with how we then live our lives, not just as women, but I think in particular, for me as a predominantly single parent, you know, what does it mean to conceive of love outside of this insatiable thirst for sacrifice? And what does it mean to recognize the sacrifice of the people, uh, the women in particular who've come before me, who had shown in, the, in their practice uh, a type of feminism that didn't have a pedagogy, right? That didn't have a language that spoke to uh, a, a not a critical, but sort of a, a, a academic uh, definition of feminism. So taking hold of that, I started in my experience uh, when I was separated from then my, my, my husband, reflecting on what it means to sit with my feminism and to sit with my daughter and to sit with myself. Uh, and exist not just as Masana, the ethereal being, but Masana, the body that has a lot of isms attached to it, the race, the sex, the gender, you know, the class. How do these all find meaning in the ways, not just that I parent my daughter, that I parent myself as well? How do I find a praxis for safety? And through this journey, I quickly realized that there's one emotion that I've struggled with, you know, there's one trope that has been labeled on the bodies of black women in particular. It's that either we are strong black women or that when we're expressing our rage, we're angry black women. And this process of articulating the recognition of these tropes that have been placed on us uh, was deeply painful because it's not something you're taught because you're taught instead to shrink yourself uh, for safety purposes, uh, particularly in South Africa, where all of the intersecting inequalities and violence fall predominantly on black women and recognizing class privilege that this falls on poor black women. The rise of the feminist movement led by young black women in South Africa, predominantly queer women, has been one that has been built on rage and anger, you know, so rather than saying time's up, saying men are trash, you know, and saying that quite boldly and unapologetically that men are in fact trash and the society in which we currently live is one that is built around ensuring that we remain silenced, ensure that, ensuring that we're able to, as Lynn, you, you speak to quite often and I quote you quite often, that we are able to socially reproduce others um, through our silence, through the containment of our anger at injustice. And having a daughter um, who identifies as a daughter, and we've had this conversation a bit, and she is very well clued up on her gender identities. I realized that the knowledge of feminism, the academic knowledge of feminism did not suffice for the embodiment of that feminism. And what was necessary for me to shift was then to sit with my discomfort, identify it, give meaning to it, give language to it, and then articulate, actually, I'm angry. I'm angry and my anger is legitimate regardless of what you think it may or may not be and what you think it, it is appropriate as a response. 
And that has been a, a process of parenting myself. But this process of parenting myself draws on this long lineage that I've witnessed within my own family. For example, my mother in an incidence of domestic violence, taking a picture of her face and uh, framing this picture and putting it up in the passage, almost as a totem to say, I want you all to remember what your father is capable of, you know? Um, and sitting with that rage, very quiet and powerful rage that stayed with me all of these years, even as a child, where I was trying to understand and articulate domestic uh, violence, understand what was okay and what was not okay. And I don't think my mother would ever call herself a feminist. But that was one of the most revolutionary things she could have done as part of this journey of parenting myself. Secondly, similarly so for my grandma, on her own experience uh, as a, a working class or a rather farmer uh, who was widowed very young with nine children. Um, and just her refusal, complete refusal to speak English to anyone. <laughs> she completely refused to speak English to anyone, regardless of her own capacity to speak English. I've never heard my grandmother say anything in English to me. I've had to sort of fumble across different strings of languages that I can speak to make sentences. And she was completely comfortable with my discomfort. She was very comfortable with me fumbling over myself. And it was part of this process of a revolution, a revolution of the personal as political, that even the ways in which I speak, the ways in which I experience myself, the ways in which I have been an, a product of a colonial, racist, sexist society, that I must myself must also be uncomfortable with how this holds body, that how this takes shape within my body. And this from my grandmother, who only had education up, up until grade six. And I think this, this conception of feminist parenting is in the praxis. And in raising my daughter, I realized that there was one lesson that I had that I could share that I think I, I hadn't witnessed before, was really that I need my anger. I need my anger to move me to places of safety. I need to embody that anger. I need to be able to confront the tropes around what that anger means. And then I also need to sit with my daughter's anger and make that anger legitimate in the space in which we occupy just the two of us and create a home where all sorts of uncomfortable emotions are normalized because the personal is is political. And these are not just tools of interpersonal relations, relationing. These are also tools of how we then navigate the external world. How we then say, actually, your actions are contributing to how I'm feeling about the situation. And I cannot divorce them from my race, from my gender, from my sexuality, from my upbringing, from my history, from my pain. And I think that for me is a critical component of feminist parenting. And where we are now, I think, is having gone through this journey of anger, we're now also learning how to think about shame. Because Alikia is such a wonderful, articulate mirror at five years old to my shortcomings, which I want to say I love most of the time, but the truth is most of the time I'm deeply uncomfortable with <laughs> how accurately she mirrors things back to me. I realize that in learning about articulating anger, I've also I had to learn about articulating shame and undoing centuries of shame that have taken root within our bodies and creating new languages and new mantras around hope and healing that allow for a broad spectrum of emotions that aren't just situated within niceties. She, for example, has this wonderful fascination with villains. You know, if she had to play a character, she would play an evil villain. And of course, you know, within the heteronormative conception of a good girl, that was an undoing for me to then accept that actually you can be a villain because villains are complex and they're situated within complex histories. Um, and it's been a wonderful process because there's, it's also come with nuggets of hope. So even in my down moments, particularly in lockdown, she said to me, it's actually, it's okay for you to be angry. Um, 
I understand maybe you just need some time alone in your room to think about your anger and when you're ready to talk about it you can come out and talk to me and not not as uh, articulate as that but as articulate in in the wonderful ways of five-year-olds and this has been a large part of our our revolution uh, one I hold dear to my heart and I wouldn't trade for for anything and one that i believe is part of the praxis like uh, winnie mantikizela mandela says that because the personal is political because our rage makes people uncomfortable it is necessary that we embody that for our own thank you so much Masana. that is so powerful and Lainas, I'm, I'm really struck by you know what you say about how our academic uh, knowledge of feminism does you know rarely suffices for the embodiment of feminism. And, you know, uh, it is struggles in a sense, and what we struggle to to define, to hold on to, to sustain that then defines what we embody and also pass on to the next generation. And you know, in a sense, the next speaker, uh, Sadaf Khan, I'm sorry, I hope you can hear me because there's a huge storm here. But Sadaf Khan, I was, uh, Sadaf, are you there? Yes, I can hear you, I can hear you. Hi, how are you? <laughs> so, I, was, I was struck by you know, your description of the, the feminist dilemmas uh, uh, that you found the experience in your journey to becoming a parent. Uh, you know, from decisions around conception, what time is the right time, the risks, you know, the risks of loss, the risks around age, uh, around societal shaming, and the birthing itself, you know, how do we do, how do we go about it? Who do we prioritize in that process? And of course, um, one of the things that really struck me was that you spoke of guilt, you know, you, you spoke of it in particular uh, reference to, you know, your cultural uh, bearings and how guilt steps in all the time to almost as, as the thing that knocks back on all of these things that you feel in your journey and the thing that you need to be responding to is the things that society imposes on you that you also have to deal with. So if, just uh, you know, speak to us about this, um, maybe reflecting on some of these things, especially this, uh, you know, the way emotions of change and how you negotiate with them and you know, these other questions. Thank you so much, Lynn. Um, I was reading back uh, my chapter a few days ago uh, when we started planning the launch and I was struck by how much has changed and how many of those emotions are still there. Um, those of you who have read the chapter would notice that I talked a lot about conflict, about internal conflict, about not knowing um, where things were going. Um, and as you mentioned, it was also about agency, about uh, my own role in deciding um, when to become a parent, how to become a parent, um, and how to engage with others who influence our parenting decisions. Um, that there was a lot of confusion, there was a lot of conflict. Um, and as you said, there was a lot of guilt attached in how we responded to the challenges that we faced um, ourselves and how we engaged with others or how I chose not to um, engage with others at, um, at that time. Um, I had, um, listening to everybody who has been um, sharing their amazing experiences, I found myself relating to different bits of it. In the very beginning, we heard an account of someone choosing not to be a mother. Um, and that was me for the first eight years of my marriage. And even before that, I thought I'd, I would never choose to be a mother. It, it seemed like an overwhelming choice. It seemed like a choice. Um, 
that would bring in more grief than joy, a choice that would put me back as a woman um, and also put me in the situation where I would, I, I fear that I would not be properly able to give back to a child um, who I'm bringing into this world. Uh, so I related to a number of emotions that um, the speaker went through. And then, um, the, you know, so for me, my journey towards parenting has gone through a number of different phases. The phase of deciding um, not to have a child and then deciding to have a child and then trying to justify that shift in the decision to myself because when I was, when I had made the choice not to have a kid for so many years, um, I had to be vocal about it. There, there's so much pressure. Um, I'm from Pakistan and it's a predominantly Muslim country. Um, it's also part of South Asia where the cultural traditions are very regressive. Women's, um, as a lot of you have said, a woman's primary worth is defined by the role she plays in the family. Her social role becomes the primary uh, model, the primary measure of her worth in the society. Um, so within that, being married for eight years um, and having not having a child was not a choice that one could just go through quietly. There were endless questions and I had to be pretty vocal in the end about why I was choosing, um, I was making the decision not to have a child. So from that point to shifting and trying to conceive, and then in addition to everything else that people throw at us, there was also that additional thing of, we already told you so. So, you know, you, we knew that as a woman, you cannot forever deny being a child. And that's not true because I know my journey took me through different places. There were reasons that I arrived at that position. But while going through that, there was also this external environment which was constantly invalidating me as a feminist, me as a woman, um, me as a married woman, uh, so to say, and the choices I had made over almost a decade. Um, so it was already a very vulnerable position to be in. Um, then there was a very physical aspect of it. I lost my first pregnancy and I lost, um, I lost my pregnancy in a very traumatic manner. I was traveling, I was alone um, when the miscarriage happened. Um, and to physically go through something that's extremely painful, that, that physically drains you um, in a completely random country alone, that itself is a draining experience. But even as I was going through that physical experience, I noticed my mind thinking more about everything I would have to hear back when I got back, when I got back among my own people, I knew that everything that I would hear is eventually going to cause more pain than the physical pain um, and the emotional pain of losing a child that I was facing. And that put me in a, that made me so much aware of my vulnerability. Um, and I realized that, you know, when, when you are making a choice, um, living in the society that we live in, um, a choice of choosing motherhood, so to say, then you somehow make yourself even more vulnerable. And that is not a very comfortable position to arrive at because you're already um, subjugated. You're already resisting, fighting constantly to justify your position in the world, um, to justify the rights that you claim, the, the space that you claim. Um, and within that now you have to justify something that you are suffering from as well. Um, so that kind of complicated my relationship uh, with my pregnancy, with my role as a mother further when we when, when I eventually had a child. Um, the other thing that I write about then and that, that I still struggle with um, was my own identity as a professional. Um, I come from a family where um, I lost my father when I was 16 and my mother had never uh, earned my mother had never been financially independent. She was dependent on her parents and then she was dependent on her husband. And then suddenly she was in a position when she had five kids ranging from 16 to one year old, never having earned anything by herself um, in a society which kind of where you could already tell that a woman in that position is never going to get married again. She's never going to find the support of a man in the traditional way that's there. Um, so having grown through that, 
uh, financial independence and career was something that instinctively like, that's essential um, that has been essential for my sense of being and that's how I define myself um, I've been working since I was a teenager I've been earning since I was a teenager and to get to that point where your career is at a stage when you can take off and you know um, you, you see yourself making that space when you remove the insecurity of um, that you might have in your career um, and then finding yourself again in a position that has traditionally been shown to have an adverse adverse effect on, on the motherhood has an adverse effect on the careers of women across the world um, so that was a very difficult choice for me to make and that that I write about how um, it questioned my feminist ideals because before that um, we, we we talk about anger, we talk about resistance, um, and that kind of also solidifies into defending our own spaces that we create for ourselves. We, we see moms, we see women as superheroes, we see their success um, as success of doing multiple things perfectly together. Um, even their vulnerabilities have to be very carefully curated. Um, and when we hear these public accounts of, you know, the, the, the praise that is sent for women, those women look very superhuman in that sense. They are taking wonderful care of their children. They are um, they're making great careers. They are giving back to the society. Um, and they have a public persona that um, somehow seems unreachable. What's never talked about in public spaces is the impact and the cost that's having on their own selves. They're doing everything, yes. And they fit a model, yes. They inspire us, yes. But at what cost? That cost is never um, really um, something that I had seen in my own spaces um, of feminist resistance. I'm, I'm, I take a, I actively take part in feminist resistance politics within the country. Um, I'm vocal about these things. So a lot of my own exposure to feminism um, has been through rage and anger and defense of our own positions as well. Um, and so what kind of shook me when I was pregnant with my um, son uh, was the kind of maternal instinct that I had not realized that I possessed um, and, and the intensity of it. Uh, so to be an angry feminist and yet feel the joy of becoming a mother, uh, yet like feel that very, you know, maternal urge of happiness when you feel your baby kicking um that's something i had not anticipated and i did not know how to navigate um so there was that joy and yet um there were all those questions that i had been grappling with what, what would happen um how would i keep my career would i be able to curate a partnership with my husband that's equal um, would i be giving up my position would i be able to give the agency to a child that a feminist mother should give would i be able to make those decisions um so many issues so much anger and yet there was that instinctive joy and i didn't know how to deal with it and i found that to be telling because that's something um that's really difficult to deal with we sorry lena i i can see you saying something but i can't hear you yes i have to cut you short because of time but um i know there'll be time in the q and a to reflect more but I'm, I'm, I'm really struck by, you know, the, the question that you seem to also be dealing with is, what is it that, that makes parenting a feminist? You know, it's not necessarily a feminist experience for everyone. And your, your, your experience shows that it is precisely this constant pushback. You know, you're not just pregnant for yourself and your partner and your nuclear family, it's, it's the whole society. And, and you're, in, in your words, you're defending your space, this, this move to constantly defend your space. Uh, but thanks a lot. And I know there will be time in the Q&A for more reflection. Um, uh, and, uh, the next uh, panelist is Daniel Long. Is, is Daniel here? Daniel, hi. Hi, I'm here. How are you? Good, thank you. Yeah, so your, your 
your chapter described very beautifully what it means to raise um, a boy child as a feminist and in, in, you know, in a feminist household, but in a patriarchal society, right? And how your struggles against, you know, you're, you also seem to be struggling with and in, imposing your feminism on this kid, even though you're trying to ensure that they grow up in a feminist household. And that's a balance. And uh, at the same time, also struggling against outside impositions on your child. So could you speak about your, your, you know, your, your chapter, but in relation to these kinds of struggles and tensions? Thank you, Lynn. Um, and thank you also, Rama, and everyone else who's been involved in bringing this labor of love to fruition. Um, it's been really inspiring. I feel very honored to be part of it, having read the other um, very inspiring and nourishing chapters. So thank you. Um, I should also begin with an apology too, which is that my biography that's been shared, I'm afraid is horribly out of date. Um, I was on maternity leave when I wrote the chapter, uh, but my youngest child is now two and a half. Um, so I've been back for a while and perhaps perhaps others will recognize the kind of spinning many plates that leads to not updating biographies and so on. Um, but for sure, that focal point that I was reflecting on when I wrote it two years ago has remained for me the kind of the big, the big challenge, right? It's navigating this world between creating a feminist family and kind of living in a feminist existence, if you like, within my family um, and needing that to coexist and connect with the wider society that we're part of. Um, and I mean, my eldest child is now eight. And so he still, he still takes me as kind of his moral compass, I think. But at the same time, he's increasingly moving out into the world under his own steam and forming his own. He's existing a large part of his life outside of my sphere of immediate influence. Um, and that's kind of, I figure it's part of my responsibility as a feminist parent to help him navigate, navigate that intersection between where we are at and where wider life is at often. Um, so we live in London, um, we live in a very um, diverse area, um, so it's hard to kind of pinpoint what, what say a dominant idea about boys roles is, but I feel across the piece it's one that kind of undervalues kindness and gentleness and compassion in boys. Um, and steers them towards this kind of slightly more authoritative, slightly more violent kind of um, way of being. And so a large part of my parenting has been to try and steer him away from that. Um, and has also been kind of about presenting gender in a very expansive fashion. So it's, so, you know, the, the superficial example is my son as a much younger child was kind of very into the whole Disney princess thing and he was wandering around in his sparkles and his Disney dress and that was his thing and and he's kind of, he's retained a slightly, some might say, feminine presentation and he's increasingly, you know, he's coming up against people who will say that's, that's for girls, that's, you look like a girl and he's happy with how he looks and at the same time he has to manage that interaction with his peers and say well actually no I'm a boy and feel that he's okay and not feel that that's some kind of superiority right so I kind of I feel like that's one of the tensions I can teach to an extent I can say well I think that's a stupid viewpoint but equally he has to kind of that's that's not the level at which we engage with other people by saying that's a stupid viewpoint um, and that's also more broadly not the kind of parenting I want to do to teach him, well, if we disagree with someone, we say they're stupid. Um, and yet nuance is quite tricky at eight. Um, so I guess, and that's still kind of where I'm struggling, really. I, in the time since I wrote that chapter, he's two years older, he's a little bit, he draws the line in a slightly different place about where he presents himself and... Uh, <laughs> I remember in year one, like when he was six years old, he came home at the end of a non-uniform day having worn like a, a jumpsuit, a quite girly piece of clothing and was annoyed that people had told him it was girls clothes, but was kind of comfortable that he was still okay. Whereas now he wouldn't wear that to school anymore. He would wear it in a, in a family um, 
environment or like with people outside of school but he wouldn't go there so he's he's learning to compromise that um and i think that's difficult because in an ideal utopian world that's not what i would be teaching him about um and yet that's the reality of what he learns you know he kind of he either has to he learns whether he's picking whether he's picking that struggle um i've waffled on slightly lost my thread um which kind of brings back to the other the other tension for me is this point between on the one hand i think feminist parenting is about raising the kind of children that we want to see in the world and children who are going to be part of that solution and to a who are going to think critically um and at the same time thinking critically means they form their own judgments and i kind of i feel really i don't want to he doesn't need to be a feminist because his mother is a feminist um and he doesn't i don't want him to feel obliged to present slightly in a challenging not looking like a boy kind of way because that that props up my feelings about gender um i want him to feel free to present himself as he is and to feel supported in who he is um and that that feels that feels like a tension and then at the same time i think you know if he if he comes when he has come home with ideas about this is for boys this is for girls i remember him sorting through um baby clothes with me for his younger sister and saying oh that's not for girls um and thinking whoa josiah we don't say that you know um so it's it's that real balance of having to challenge versus versus reflecting and being and kind of hoping hoping that with with compassion and continued debate and discussion that he's gonna become the kind of man that i would like him to be whilst also respecting that actually he's he's not me he's he's a whole nother person um i mean i guess as well i'm kind of conscious of the way that the, my family looks potentially to outsiders so i had him as a single parent on my own as a conscious choice um i was young when i had him i was 24 i was very sure this was the way i wanted to do it that politically i didn't think my parenthood had to be connected to my romantic relationships or to any kind of economic commitment like marriage um and because my children are also of dual heritage their donor is um from zimbabwe and i'm kind of i'm aware that there are all sorts of intersections there and the way that we can be perceived as a single parent family fits into different people's narratives and sometimes often it's the case to be challenging those head on and saying actually that's not what we're about actually don't impose your stories about abandoned women or about men derelicting their duties or about um kind of the arrogance of deciding that myself as a young lesbian woman that i could do it and everyone else has to live with it so some of it is about challenging that and some of it also comes back to that point about engaging with the world where we are and you you don't you don't influence people by kind of endless antagonism um yeah i just got your message <laughs> so um yeah to tie things together um gosh i could talk for a whole another 5 minutes now that my daughter is 2 and i'm thinking about raising a girl but um i'll tie up there and thank you for your time thanks sana again i know there'll be some more space in the q and a to to reflect on this um unfortunately one of the other panelists nikki peterson had to leave uh but the last panelist uh is uh elena Is Elena here? I am here, yes. Hi. Um I I I found your your I mean your chapter was you know deeply uh moving and I learned through it about you know the pain and the loneliness that marks the lives of women who are abusing uh, who are parenting through abusive uh, uh relationships uh in a way you speak very uh powerfully about the kinds of again relations of guilt and the transparency but also how children sometimes 
mediate our transition out of toxic relationships, right? In ways that are deeply feminist. So, you know, perhaps you could share more with us about your, your own journey and in, in relation to this question specifically. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I hope it's okay. I'm keeping my camera off. My chapter is really private for me and I struggle a lot, obviously, in my life and like in the process of writing it. And I'm, I'm really happy to have been able to contribute to this really great book. And I'm so touched also to be here and to hear about other people's experience and how they share their thoughts. Um, so yeah, I wrote the chapter that is called Thinking and Par Practicing Parenting or How to Do Right by My Child and by Myself. Um, my chapter is also very personal, much less theoretical, and it's an account of the experiences and thoughts and reflections that I encountered in the process of becoming a mother. Um, and since I wrote the chapter, obviously, like a few things have changed, but I, I have been trying to think about the kind of lessons perhaps of the kind of points that I would like to make that I think are important in my experience and can be useful for other people as well. So I, I thought about like three rough points. The first point really was and that was like my how I saved myself from a very toxic relationship if you will is that I noticed that feminist parenting although those were not the terms I was thinking uh, in at the time, but like living a good life somehow and doing right by my child and by myself meant living a life that is aligned with my values. So what that meant really in my context was that I really had to address the difficult relationship between being empathetic, um, but recognizing and dealing with the fact that they are personal and sometimes also like culturally infused differences between people and that it's necessary to establish boundaries. So when having a child, generally, I believe that there's always some kind of clash of like perceptions of normality. Very often, especially when we're a bit older, when we have our children, we are so used to living independently somehow that we don't necessarily no notice these things because we live so independently and so much on our own terms that we have the agency to form life the way we want it. But then when we become parents, it's hard. I think it's hard for everyone and it's really intense and it's tiring. And, and, and those clashes of what we perceive as normal come out much more clearly, if you will. And I, I do assume that those clashes, or I see like in all of the friends I have, that there's hardly ever any people who become parents without having major conflicts about what it means to do what and what it means to be parents, what it means to be a mom, what it means to be a dad. But sometimes I think that perhaps these clashes are amplified between parents who are from very different backgrounds. And backgrounds might be class, might be upbringing, might be cultural connotations. Um, but like for me, what I really noticed was that it was important how to learn how to communicate um, and how to be empathetic. So also like notice that when someone is presenting or behaving in a way that clashes with their own normal doesn't necessarily mean they mean to offend you, but still like finding legitimacy and noticing that that is not how I want to live my life. And one of the things of course that like I really like noticed a lot in that context was that a lot of the um, a lot of how we behave and what we find normal is related to the societal surrounding in which we are coming, uh, we are raised and we are evolving. And that, of course, the patriarchy is a very big component of that. Um, and like in, in recent years, we speak much more about like the horrible effects that toxic masculinity can have on women, but also on men. And that very often in the process, men lack the tools to perceive and question and deconstruct these toxic norms that are also being imposed on them and they suffer from them as well. So finding a balance between the empathy for knowing that toxic masculinity norms, if you will, are imposed on men and they're struggling and suffering from them as well. Um, but still like finding boundaries towards whether or not I accept that that person is struggling from it and I am the recipient of that. Like finding those boundaries is really difficult. So like, but fundamentally, like what I really had to go through was that feminist parenting fundamentally means that two people or more or less who are involved in, in parenting have to define together which norms they want for their family. So there is, it's a kind of a social contract, if you will, that people build together where both people or more or less have to find themselves and that we have a right as a parent to, have a, to raise our children in a social contract that suits us, that is not imposed on us. So boundary. Um, the second point in relation to that as well is that I really noticed how important it is to get men on board. 
and to include them in the parenting conversations from the beginning. So I, I think many of us witness that. And sometimes we don't necessarily, we're not necessarily aware of that, but we witness those tendencies and so many women to assume that men just don't know how to parent and to assume a responsibility somehow where we think we know better how to do it. But the process is deeply disabling and also di actively disengaging men. And at the very least, very often that leads to, to a self-fulfilling prophecy of men actually stepping back. Um, I, I think like a core issue here is that men are very often neglected in preparing for parenthood. They're neglecting themselves and they're being neglected by society because a lot of like becoming parents centers around how will your life be as a mother. And um, I think in many men, there's like a lack of recognition that they might struggle with becoming a parent emotionally, psychologically. And they often, again, don't have the tools and the society, socially accepted conversations to accommodate that discomfort and to learn how to address that in a, in a healthy way. So I think that fathers need to be part of the solution of feminist parenting, not just mothers, just as men need to be part of the gender equity solution or as white people need to be part of addressing and confronting white privilege and structural racism. Um, so yeah, I think fundamentally like men really need to learn how our patriarchal societies in which many of us live, teach them how to behave in a certain way and that that can be really toxic and that they need to learn how to become more aware of that and that they have a choice to be more inclusive and more included in parenting. So that's my second point. And then very briefly, just a third point, um, which is, is, is related. Ah, my time is up. Okay, so just like one last sentence again about the challenges of solo parenting. Um, just very briefly, like three short thoughts. Someone who gets steps away from a toxic relationship does not necessarily want to be alone. So don't blame them from step, for stepping out of the toxic relationship. Second, getting out doesn't mean that you get rid of the biological heritage that the biological other parent brings to your child. And you have to learn how to make a difference between being fair to the child, like protecting the child, but being fair to them, giving them an opportunity of building their own opinion and not transferring your own, your own issues on, on, on the child. And third, last one on a bit more optimistic note, if you feel ready to find love again or to find a partner again, don't, don't refrain from doing that. I, I witnessed so many parents who became single um, that they feel like they have an obligation to remaining, to remaining single or they have an obligation to not exposing the child to someone else. And what I really believe is that love is, there's not a finite pool of love. And the child will be happy when the mom is happy, when the parent is happy. And a child can always have more love in their lives. So don't refrain from that. Allow yourself to be happy. And there are good chances your child will be happy too. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Elena. And thank you, Danya and Masana and Sada for sharing um, your reflections with us. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I mean, this is a discussion we could have all day, but time is not on our side. So I'll hand over to the, the last panel of, of this uh, book launch. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, welcome to our third panel discussion on feminist parenting perspective from Africa and beyond. I'm Usman Job, and I'll be your host for the next 25 minutes, maybe 20, because um, we're expecting four panelists, but we haven't seen Katie yet. So who do we have today on our panel? We've got Malaika. Iyo, who's a student at the University of Toronto, studying politics and African studies. We also have, well, we hope to have Shesen, more known under the name of Katie, one of the most famous and influential musicians in Senegal. We also have Francoise Moulunt. She is a Pan-Africanist with roots in Cameroon. She's also a feminist enabler. She'll tell us what a feminist enabler means. And finally, we have Alun John, a Franco-Senegalese entrepreneur who is very passionate about marketing and branding. I had planned to tell you a little bit about me, but I can see that it's been all posted on the chat. So I'm not really going to tell you, you know, uh, about my, uh, my job and what I've done, etc. I'm just going to go straight to, you know, a quick summary of my piece. In a feminist parenting perspective, from Africa and beyond the book. My piece is entitled The Struggling Feminist. 
In my piece, I describe the inner fight between my theory and my practice. This is basically what I have gone through while I was growing up and things I've been taught by my family, by society, uh, in the wider context. And then what I learned when I grew up um, and how I am managing uh, that struggle to getting rid of the bits that I don't agree with anymore, the bits that I don't like about me, and incorporating uh, the new teaching that I am learning from people, whether it is from university or uh, from uh, people I meet in life in general. I also describe other young Senegalese who did not like to be labeled feminists, how I learned to proudly call myself feminist after years. And I hope, you know, it, this would have been after I met uh, my girlfriend at the time, now wife. And finally, in my piece, I talk about my relationship with my partner, my wife, and the arrival of our new son. But without further ado, um, I will just invite our four panelists, three, I think, actually, because Katie is not uh, joined us yet. So let's start with uh, Francoise. Francoise, um, you describe yourself as a Pan-Africanist feminist. You're also a feminist enabler. What, what do you mean by that? But also, can you tell us um, what has changed in, you know, about your piece in, uh, in, in the book and what has changed since you wrote it? Hi, thank you, Usman, uh, for the introduction, and thanks uh, very much, Rafama and the team, for inviting me to join both this webinar and, uh, and to lend my voice to this really powerful chorus of uh, feminists uh, reflecting on what parenting means to them. I actually do not describe myself as a feminist enabler, but I like it very much. <laughs> I think for me it means, uh, it means uh, enabling us as feminists to have conversations about who we are and uh, what we are, our experiences are, not just what we know and what we fight for and what our expertise is. And that's what I do with my work with uh, my platform, Ayala. Um, I was really delighted to be invited to, to be a part of this uh, reflection on feminist parenting. Um, and, uh, and to be honest, when uh, I was invited to do so, I couldn't, I couldn't not think about my mother. And what I've learned about feminist parenting from my mother, who I discovered on the late that she says she's not a feminist, I was so shocked. And that's really what I'm talking about in, in my chapter. Um, and uh, I think what I wanted to, to explain is that I was so sure she was a feminist because uh, of her obsession uh, that she passed on to me about uh, women's agency, that she passed on to me as a, it's one of my very first uh, memories that I described of being told. I better go to school so I can be autonomous. So if my husband tell me get out of house, I can say you get out of the house because my house too. So and 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 growing and then seeing how uh, much she would grow into more non-feminist um, uh, behavior, and then realizing actually from hearing from her uh, that she's actually not a feminist and what that meant for me, etc., is what I explore. I think also. Uh, I also wrote about learning about uh, judgments uh, in feminism and in feminist parenting, how it's impossible to judge others. Uh, and it's, it's, it's uh, so complicated to judge yourself. So I, I think I'm writing also about um, the fact that there's no room for perfectionism and self-judgment uh, and self-shame in feminist parenting. Um, and lastly, I think this chapter is about showing the, the difference between, uh, as I said, my, my own mother's obsession for uh, agency while my focus as a feminist parent is on freedom, uh, enabling my children to be fully who they are. Uh, and that also is a testament to how the agency for me is like now, uh, is, is such a minimum. Um, and very uh, briefly, I just wanted to, ask, uh, to answer this question that was as in preparation to us on what has happened since. I think because of COVID, I've been spending more time with my children than ever, probably more than I, I thought I wanted. Um, and I think this thing about freedom that I've been infusing in the way I parent them 
it's been really challenging actually because I uh, I realized uh, now the exercises and in, in my face every day when I sometimes I just want to say you know stop because I told you so. Uh, I think that tension has been really uh, interesting to see in motion, um, but also freedom. I, I, we've had a lot of conversations about them being free uh, in a world uh, where uh, the uh, their, their lives and their freedom can be attacked. Uh, just because they have uh, black skin. And we live in Morocco, so that's actually very much part of the daily life, even though they are quite small. Um, so we've been talking about freedom a lot and, and thinking about it collectively a lot. Um, and lastly, what I've learned from being in this conversation with all of the contributors and with Rama has been that I always thought that feminist parenting was a lonely path, um, but this community of, of like, collective reflection on, on what feminist parenting is has been extremely nurturing for me. Reading the book has been, being in this webinar today has been. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for that. Uh, it's actually allowed me to have uh, many, many more conversations about feminist parenting uh, since then. I'm hoping to do more. So I think my time is up. I'm going to stop here, but thanks again. Thank you very much, Francoise. You're definitely right. It is, it is a learning and it is a journey. And uh, it doesn't matter what you know, different styles one is using. You can always find um, you know, common points you know, between your friends, between your mother, between your father, to how it is done. It is definitely um, the most crucial and important point. You actually have uh, many points in, in common with uh, our next uh, uh, panelist, which is Malaika. She has written a piece with her, uh, with her mother. Um, let's uh, invite Malaika uh, to come and uh, actually answer the same question. Um, you know, tell us about your piece, Malaika, and uh, what has changed since uh, you've written it. Um, but can you also, you know, dig into that special relationship between you and your mother? Um, hi, everybody. I'm going to keep my camera off just because it's 7 a.m. where I'm currently based in Toronto, so I haven't had the chance to prepare myself to be on camera. Um, but it's been really cool hearing everybody's speeches um, and what you guys have had to say. I guess to start, um, your first question was about um, the piece itself. I had written that piece, I guess it would be about two, almost three years ago now, um, when I was attending the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. <clears throat> um, at the time, I had recently um, been involved with a large protest against um, anti-Black racism at my high school, Pretoria High School for Girls. Um, and the situation at that school was that they weren't allowing students to come to school with their natural hair, um, students of African descent to come to school with their natural hair. Um, and so in that period, I guess I was trying to um, like actually take stock of what I wanted the world to look like. Um, and feminism was one of those things, especially being at an all girls high school and being involved in a protest that was specifically centered um, on young women. Um, in the piece, I briefly read it the other day. I haven't had a lot of time since I have a new job here. Um, what I picked up about where I was when I wrote that piece was I think my mom has been really instrumental in exposing me to a lot of really cool influences um, both in terms of like literature and people um, throughout my life. I think I've always had like a strong circle of feminist women in my space um, and I don't think there's ever necessarily been any like sit down teaching but in terms of being connected to certain people um, and exposed to certain ideas I think has been crucial and at least shaping the foundation um, and also understanding where I would like to be different. Um, so yeah, I don't know how to more specifically answer the question. I guess I could go into where I am right now. Um, I'm currently a student finishing up at the University of Toronto. I'm doing African studies, creative writing, and um, political science. Um, and a large portion of my degree has been focused on African feminism. And so that's something that I'm definitely gonna be pursuing in the future. Um, in terms of what has changed in terms of my own political opinions, I think that um, when I was initially writing the piece, because I was so much younger, I think it, um, it isn't necessarily as radical or progressive as maybe something I would write now would be, even in terms of um, 
like being able to reflect the experiences of multiple women and even my own. I think that my own opinions, both on feminism and like what I believe feminism could be moving forward have changed quite a bit since I was 18, 19, um, writing that work. But it was really beautiful to look back and see um, like what a younger me was thinking about. Um, in terms of the relationship with my mom, I'm super grateful for being able to be in her presence and having her in my life. Um, she definitely was somebody who was incredibly instrumental um, in my early years in showing me what it was like to be a successful woman um, and then also a woman who is constantly around other women I think was really powerful in terms of seeing um, I think she has a really strong community of other women of color around her which has always been inspiring to me in the ways that like I could form friendships and relationships with people um, that don't necessarily have to be centered on men um, or non-people of color um, so yeah I'm really grateful to her for that that's all. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Malaike. Uh, I definitely agree. Um, inspirations are needed. Um, and uh, yes, you need those strong people who, you know, believe in causes and inspire the next generation. And, you know, lucky that you, you know, you had a mom who put you on the road and um, obviously, you know, showed you the way. Yes, you are lucky. Mm -hmm. We are going to continue on the inspirational um, journey. Um, but going the other way around because now we have uh alun john uh who is an entrepreneur uh, and a male who uh, you know calls himself feminist and who you know he's doing the opposite journey he's now trying to inspire you know his daughter um of course with the help of uh, his wife um let's welcome alu and alu if you could just answer um, the same question um you know Give us a brief summary about, you know, your piece and what has changed uh, since now. Uh, hello, hello, Osman. Thank you. Thank you for, for this conversation. Rama, thank you for providing the platform and for me to, to tell my, my story. Uh, this has been a, an, amazing, an amazing journey. So my uh, chapter discusses uh, my initiation to parenthood and attempts to, uh, to understand actually the man uh, I am today, including the definition of, of feminism uh, and how I apply it to my uh, everyday, everyday life. Um, as a young and first time parent, my experiences uh, as a child, uh, teenager, and now adult uh, have contributed to how I make the choices I do uh, today. Um, first of all, as a child and, and teenager, I have, you know, violently but silently uh, resisted to, um, resisted the idea that men have more professional duties and women, um, you know, the domestic ones, um, such as raising a child or cooking. Um, you know, I say silently because my um, my family was as patriarchal as the other families around us, um, and I and I grew up and evolved in two very contrasting environments uh, from from boyhood to my early uh, adolescence and uh, from adolescence to my uh, my young adulthood. I spent my very first twelve years in Senegal. My dad was the breadwinner as most families uh, in, in, in Senegal, whereas my mother uh, stayed at home and took care of uh, my other six siblings and, and myself. Um, as I was very close to my mother, I saw how much of a uh, brilliant professional career she could have had if, if she, she had been allowed to or if, if she allowed herself to pursue her, her passions. Uh, yet my father and, and mother did not challenge the, uh, the established uh, gender roles um, of, of the traditional uh, Senegalese culture. At a very, very young age, I could not stand seeing, uh, seeing her doing all the household uh, work. So uh, growing up in Senegal where gender norms are highly accentuated, my sister and I were most of the time supporting my mother with these responsibilities. Uh, at best, I, I created strategies, you know, to assist uh, my mom as much as I could. Uh, I remember often uh, playing a game with, with friends in my home 
uh, asking them to spill soapy water on the floor uh, and inviting them to show their best, you know, gliding move movements. Um, and after this little game, I would usually give 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 a floor cloth to to each uh, one of them to contribute to the cleaning. Uh, I guess this was my my way of challenging the gendered uh, behavior of, of boys. And then at the age of 13, I moved in in uh, with my Senegalese uncle who was married with a French woman. Um, and in my new home, I, I lived with uh, three cousins uh, whom I considered my siblings, two uh, white female cousins from my from a previous marriage and one very young uh, mixed heritage uh, son from uh, my aunt and uncle. Roles then were a lot more gender balanced because both my uncle and aunt were uh, working full time and at home they shared the household management. The word uh, feminism itself never entered my mind and never entered the house really. Uh, and, and was never pronounced at home. Um, but I was experiencing and witnessing true partnership in the house. Uh, they would share and debate how to best raise the children without gender uh, stereotyping them, um, or uh, they would together discuss the costs related to running the household, um, among other, other matters. Um, this experience shaped my views I believe, and instilled within, within me true egalitarian values. Uh, so my feminism, I think, is one that treats both men and women equally and attentive to, and is attentive to issues of, of, of justice. And I think this is what I'm trying to, to say in my, in my piece. And what has changed uh, since I wrote it, I, I believe that of, of the many, many concerns I had when I was writing this piece, uh, financial stability was actually one of the most loud, uh, one, one that most uh, loudly resonated in my head. Um, and actually I'm finding that there, is, uh, there may be more essential things, more essential challenges, because as a, as a, as a young father to, to my daughter, I, I believe that I have a crucial role to play in defying you know established norms and uh but also raising a child as a who, who's a black girl actually um and 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 growing in in scotland right and and as lately emphasized by black life matters uh she'll inevitably i think experience some racism so i measure more than ever the challenge she will she will go through Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aliu. Um, yes, that's that's very inspirational. I, I, I suppose, you know, going through the three pieces, um, um, obviously Katie didn't manage to make it. Going through the three uh, pieces, uh, you know, you can tell that you guys have been focusing on partnership, on, 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 on sharing experiences. And I, and I suppose that's the most important thing here. You know, it's about people working together sharing experiences and moving together, pulling and pushing each other in the right direction. Without further ado, I am going to just give the floor to Fiona, uh, who is the chair and who will be wrapping up and taking on uh, questions and answers from the audience. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed, Usman, and thanks very much indeed all the contributors and uh, facilitators. Um, I think it's been an absolutely fantastic uh, event, really uh, rich and engaging. I think that's probably no surprise then that, that, uh, that we've, we've almost uh, run out of time. We're into extra time, uh, if you like. Um, and I think that's some measure um, of the, the power and, and richness of the speakers' uh, journeys. Um, and I think for many of us, we found the listening uh, to these journeys uh, an act of catharsis ourselves and of solidarity. So thank you so much indeed. I think what comes through very clearly is, is the urgency uh, that parenting brings to feminist practice uh, and, and the struggles uh, around 
uh, around that. Um, what I'd like to do is, is, is add to the list of emotions that have been brought out in the panel by, by adding uh, those qualities of honesty and courage, because I think what we've seen is, is very much unvarnished and honest uh, accounts of the dilemmas uh, and struggles in, in sharp contrast to, I think it was Sadaf who talked about the lean in, uh, manicured, polished uh, versions of, of parenthood and super parents. Most of the comments that we've had have been uh, really just um, reinforcing what people have said and thanking speakers. But we have one question that we've got time for that I'd like to, to put to whomever uh, on the panels uh, would like to, to, to answer it. And, and this comes from uh, Nancy, who talked about how much she liked the intentionality um, uh, that comes with feminist parenting. So the intentionality that's been raised by speakers around choice, around freedom, values, agency, and so on. And what she wanted to ask uh, panelists was, she wants to understand what were the, the tensions and challenges uh, looking in particular at work uh, policies in the market. So we've probably got time for about two or three of the panelists to come in very quickly on that so so who would like to who would like to do that who would who would like to come in and and have a go at answering that for for us don't be shy In which case, I, I, I wonder if um, Rama, you might like to, to make a start on this. I am sorry, I am currently parenting a little one. Ah, okay, okay. Is there somebody else then that will, um, that will come in on that? Visa, Masana. I, I, I will try. Can you just repeat the question? Um, yes, so it's, it's really trying to understand um, the, the tensions and challenges of, of combining feminist parenting um, with the kind of current work policies and, and you know, discipline of the market. Yes, so uh, I, I suppose I kind of experienced that. Um, it, 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 is, it is quite challenging um, because whether it is on policy or just even when the policy um, is available, just uh, the, the judgment and the treatment of society when someone decides to apply the policy. You know, for example, I wanted to take a longer paternity leave uh, when our son was born. And, um, you know, it wasn't made that easy. Um, number one, from the HR department, they, was not, they were not used to basically accommodating men and applying that part of the policy. So the policy was there, but even HR people did not know about it. Um, so they had to themselves go and dig deeper understanding before they came and explained to me what I had to do, papers I had to fill in. Um, but even once you had done that, um, you then had, um, you know, your colleagues uh, as, as a man who, you know, they, they won't come and tell you exactly, um, you know, what they think or feel, but, you know, you, you would hear it from conversation, you know, small words. And, and, I, and I suppose, you know, that's my perspective from a man. I'm, I'm sure it's, you know, a hundred times more difficult, you know, for women, um, you know, who would be trying to use certain parts of policy you know, to accommodate, you know, um, the, the new arrival in their family. So, you know, that's just an example. But, but in summary, it is very difficult. And, it, you know, you have to fight for it. You have to, you know, show that this is a something I really want and need to do. And, you know, whether you support me or not, I am going to do it. And I think indeed there's, there's also that additional thing, isn't there, that, that for men to ask for um, um, uh, there to be any kind of work-life 
uh, balanced policies. It, you, you're breaking a certain logic of appropriateness. So there, there are different sorts of um, gendered dilemmas, aren't there, in, in the relationship between parenting and work. So that's very interesting. Would any of our other speakers like to come in? I think that if what you can do is uh, raise your hand. So, uh, yes, so I've got Lisa, Elena rather. And Catherine as well. Yes, Catherine, so. Yeah. Thank you. What I was just thinking about very briefly was that our the the institution where I work recently in recent years got a lot of positive press because they they did a few things that were considered to be progressive. One of them being that they installed a mother's room at our on our campus. From the beginning, I took issue with the fact that it was called a mother's room. I was like, mm -hmm. so what does that mean? Does that mean that women are the only ones who are targeted in, in the idea that parenting should somehow be, um, be possible for people who have full-time careers? That was one, but like my bigger, my bigger one is that they, the institution adopted a policy on being allowed to travel with infants. Um, which is specifically extended to women only. Um, so that initially was like celebrated as a big success. And I used that a lot when my daughter was small. Um, but the issue is that just having a policy, but not implementing it in a way that is sensible is a crucial issue. And I think that that is one of the things that many of us who are very political in our own lives, we notice very often that there's the written word and then there's the way it's being done. And the way it is being done in our institute is that the cost has to be has to be um, covered by the projects that are paying for the staff time of the staff in in question. So what that means is that rather than making things more accessible and easy, is that basically it makes it more difficult for a supervisor to choose to employ or put a person on their project who is a woman of childbearing age because they potentially face the additional cost of having to pay for the policy out of the project funds. So what it I've actually been ends up reinforcing inequality. Absolutely. Yeah. So what I've been really rooting for is that they have to find some kind of centralized mechanism to fund that policy to relieve the burden from the supervisors who hold the budgets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just one yeah, contribution. Very much indeed. Uh, and Catherine, can you come in with the, the last intervention? Well, you've, got, you've got about two minutes. Oh, please uh, take, take a couple more after this. Um, just building on what uh, Usman and uh, Elena said, I have discovered the absolute necessity within our organizations to work for uh, policies where men and women have the same number, same amount of time for access to maternity, paternity um, leave if we want to change social norms. Um, I've been in instances where African men have wanted to take uh, more than the maybe two weeks that's allowed by law. And it is not good to have to refuse that. So we, we have to evolve our, um, evolve our policies. And also we'll be faced with gender stereotypes. Oh, don't give my husband, make sure that my husband doesn't receive three months of leave. He'll just go off drinking and things like that. There are those stereotypes that will be put in our faces to say why we shouldn't do this. But I believe <laughs> that, uh, that is not uh, the, the, the norm. At any rate, just wanted to build on what uh, Usman and Elena were saying. Thanks so much. Um, we have now run out of time. So I think um, that what I'll do is I'll bring things to a close now. I'd like to um, thank Rama, thank the facilitators, and especially thank uh, all the contributors for sharing their their journeys uh, of feminist uh, parenting. This has been such an inspiring and engaging discussion and I'm sure that a lot of the conversations uh, will, will continue. I highly recommend the book uh, and I have put in the chat um, links through uh, for those who'd like uh, more information. Uh, so thank you all very, very much indeed uh, for joining us. Uh, for this uh, book launch. Thank you and goodbye.